Hey family, and welcome to the Critical Sense Making Sessions with yours truly, Revolutionary Rika. Welcome to episode 12. Today's topic is intergenerational trauma. Today's guest is Shonda Watson. She is a Bay Area native who is passionate about spirituality, health and wellness, and her children. Shonda, tell us a little bit more about who you are and choose one word to describe how you're showing up. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. I am really excited to be here. Um, as you said, my name is Shonda Watson. I was born and raised in Oakland. Um, I'm a single mother of two wonderful boys, uh, one five, one twenty four, who is autistic and in college. So I'm excited to share that. Um, I'm also a social worker. I have a master's degree in social work and I am obtaining hours to become a licensed clinical social worker because I, um, along with medical social work, I also provide counseling. Um, that pretty much sums up where I am right now. Okay, and one word of how you're showing up today. Uh, unconventional. All right. Yeah. Well, welcome and I thank you for um, um, being willing to come on and share your authentic story with our guests. So just to kick us off, I would love to get um, your reaction to this historic election that just took place and us having our first um, woman of color in the vice presidency. So I will be honest, I'm not a huge news watcher. Um, I didn't keep up with anything that was going on. People were calling me like, are you watching this? I'm like, no, I'm not. Um, I did uh, watch a couple of the highlights, but I, I really believe in, I believe that the last four years were needed mm. um, as hard as they were they were needed. You know, sometimes we have to filter and clean out some things. Mm -hmm. And I know and trust and believe that everything happens um, for a, a reason. So I was excited to hear that we showed up, to mm -hmm. hear that our voice is becoming one because that's where the strength is gonna come from. You know, us being one um, as a nation, as a community, as a human race, as a culture. So I wasn't surprised because I just, I. I'm learning and I have learned a lot to trust the process. So I, I knew that whatever we got is exactly what we needed and it is exactly what we needed. So I, I'm excited to see us represented in yeah. office. I'm excited to, to see us represented in office. That Absolutely. means a lot to me as um, an African-American woman. Yeah, and I, I um, echo your sentiments around the last four years. I think we needed to get, we have to learn to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And they have been uncomfortable, but they pulled the covers out over things that we thought had been eradicated, but it just showed us that they weren't. Um, someone had shared, I think it was my, um, the executive director of the Human Rights Commission used to say, um, everybody thought because we had a black president, racism was done with, look, we had a black president, but <laughs> the last decade has showed us that that's, that wasn't true. And then if not, 2020 has definitely um, highlighted what that, the work that needs to be done around racism, anti-racism and racism and all of those isms that, you know, live here in America. Right. I want to say, you know, I, I watched a movie not too long ago called Collateral Beauty. Mm -hmm. And there was a part in the movie where as this mother was grieving for her child that she knew was dying, this woman sat next to her and she said, don't forget to pay attention to the collateral beauty of what's coming out of what you are experiencing. And not only has the racism that has never gone anywhere <laughs> just become right. evident now to people who, who weren't aware of it, who did not have to experience it, but what has come out of this is our strength, is the reason why racism exists because we are such a magnificent 
race of people. Like we are amazing. We are kings and queens out here walking around and yeah. not saying that we are the only race that is, but I can only speak from this perspective mm -hmm. and to be doubted so much to be stereotyped so much just because of the color of our skin when there's so much beauty and magic in who we are that was highlighted as well and I don't want us to overlook that because we came together like mm -hmm. never before the younger generation has stepped up for us mm -hmm. the things that I've heard them be able to do I'm, I'm like I'm so proud <laughs> Yes, you know, absolutely. I'm just proud. So that was the collateral beauty of the last four years for me to be able to see that, absolutely. you know. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing your perspective on that. So tell us a little bit about life growing up in Oakland. Whew. Honestly, Erica, some days it is a blur. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, as I said, Oakland native, my first years were spent in Brookfield. Um, I was raised by a single mom. I had, I'm, I'm the oldest and the only girl. Uh, my mom was an only child and adopted. Um, so growing up, I had a lot of time with my grandparents. Um, being a latchkey kid, uh, I went to a lot of different schools. <laughs> Uh, private schools, public schools. Um, it was a lot navigating the Bay Area um, in the space that I was in. Mm -hmm. I can't say that it was fun. Um, I don't have a lot of great memories, mm -hmm. uh, just a lot of experiences that taught me and, and, and brought the person that you see today. Um, it was tough though. Yeah. Yeah. It Absolutely. was pretty tough. Yeah. Well, thinking back on your childhood, how was trauma addressed in your family? Uh, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. It was, uh, but it wasn't addressed in my immediate family because it wasn't addressed the generation before me and the generation before that. It just wasn't addressed and it's kind of um, normal mm -hmm. to not talk about things that are happening to overlook them, you know, as parents, sometimes our parents have learned through the intergenerational trauma to normalize certain behaviors and reactions to things that children do, you know, I always tell my clients you were taught from zero to 18 not to question what I say. Mm -hmm. Don't speak back to me. D just do as I say. Don't have a voice. Don't have an opinion. Don't have feelings about it. And then if you do, keep it to yourself. Mm -hmm. okay. That's traumatic. Yeah. Right? Because where was, where is the voice of the child? You know, mm -hmm. um, I didn't have a voice mm -hmm. as a child. And that reminds me, I'm sorry, that reminds me of um, um, Dr. DeGry's book, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. Mm -hmm. And those behaviors came out of slavery. They had to teach us that so that the, the master would not come down on those, those, young, those children, because a lot of times those children did not get to be children beyond what, four or five years old. And so listening to you say that, I can understand now why children are to be seen and not heard, why that was kind of passed down because it was for our protection, but at the same time, it didn't teach us to advocate for when, um, for ourselves in situations when we knew we were right, but you know, you just got, that's the adult, the adult is always right kind of um, attitude, so. It was turned into a respect thing. Yep, yeah. But where did that come from? It came from slaves having to respect their owners. Yeah. And we inherited that behavior and normalized it in our own communities. And we've just been passing it down as a normal response. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so how did you manage the trauma you experienced? So 
always say I have been in a flight or fight state for all of my life. Um, I was an angry child. Mm -hmm. um, everything I did was through anger. So I remember being in the third grade getting kicked out of class. Mm -hmm. I remember being in elementary school, Brookfoot Elementary School. I was the bully's bully. Mm -hmm. So kids would come to me if they were being bullied because I'm no, that that would be a no. Mm -hmm. I was fighting boys. I was just fighting. I didn't have a voice. That's what happens mm -hmm. when you don't allow children to have a voice. You know, um, the natural response of a baby, of an infant when you bring it home is to cry mm -hmm. for its needs to be met. Yes. and to fuss and cry and fuss and cry and fuss and cry. Well, if that's the only voice that a child is ever offered and that's the only way that they know how to respond, then that just goes with them. Like they take that coping mechanism and they use it until they learn something different. Mm -hmm. So I was angry for a very, very long time on into my twenties, mm -hmm. early thirties. It, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that I've been reading articles on the adultification of black girls. And mm -hmm. a lot of times some of the behaviors that we um, black girls exhibit in the classroom, they are then seen as they are looked at as perceived to be older, instead of realizing that, okay, if this, if this young lady is angry every day, there's, let's think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, there's a need not being met. And so as the educator, what am I doing I should be recognizing that, but then what am I doing to help uh, help this young person heal from whatever it is they're going through or to feel that need? And so I hear you saying that just a little bit of, maybe you can share a little bit about how did any educators ever attempt to support you or to find out what was going on? So I don't wanna say no, because I definitely have, well, yes and no. So no nobody ever tried to figure out what was going on with me nobody ever asked me what's wrong or why are you angry or how can i help you how can i support you i never got that did i have educators along the way that looked like me that understood me culturally yes so they took me under their wing they were nice to me consistently even when i was being not so nice. <laughs> they were still nice to me. And I remember um, some educators in particular, one in elementary school who in the private school that I was going to, who actually ended up being the principal and teacher of my oldest son. Mm -hmm. She has since passed away, Georgia Gayton. I will never forget her. Mm -hmm. And another um, of my high school teachers, Delia Smith, mm -hmm. I still talk to her. I love her. Mm -hmm. I love her and cultural competence. It's not being taught enough mm -hmm. for people who are coming into these communities, teaching our children, they don't nothing about us. Mm -hmm. And the sad part is even those of us that are in the school system teaching, a lot of us are bringing the bad behaviors mm -hmm. to the schools. Yes teaching the children what they're learning at home, which is wrong. So nobody is, and I don't wanna say nobody because there are a lot of people, you know, things are changing, people are changing, systems are changing. But when I was growing up, <clears throat> there was nobody to sit down and say, you know, children don't raise themselves. So this little girl is getting angry for some reason. It's not for nothing. Children are not angry for no reason. Children don't misbehave for no reason. They don't raise themselves. They don't come here knowing. And so that wasn't addressed in the education system for me mm -hmm. going through it. But there are people that definitely impacted and influenced my life even today, even the bad ones. I had a teacher once tell me, well, I don't care if you learn or not, I'm gonna get paid either way. Hmm. back then I'm thinking you don't know how nervous I am because I don't know this I'm not getting help at home like 
she didn't know all of that. So then I became defensive and she became my enemy. Mm. And, I, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that because uh, many of the young people that I've worked with have had teachers say something similar to that, you know, to them. And for me, I, feel, I believe, at, you know, to be an educator, it's a calling. It is a calling that you have to be born with. It takes a unique person to work with young people and empower them. And to be able to recognize when those young people are coming in and something's off, something's amiss, or just like, why is this kid expected to be like an adult and the kid is in fourth or fifth grade? Like developmentally, they don't have those skills. They may be able to perform some tasks like they are, but developmentally, they should be able to be a kid. And I think for many of our children, um, they are being robbed of their childhood because they are expected to be um, adult-like or, you know, much more is expected of them than their counterparts from different ethnicities. Absolutely. Because we have a stereotype on us that says different. So if we feel pain, if we're complaining about something, mm -hmm. you know, we're expected to, but that expectation that comes from slavery also is the same expectation that's in the house. Mm -hmm. Kids are expected to know certain things. And I'm like, how did you teach them? <laughs> did you teach your children what you're mad at them for not knowing? Yeah. Probably not. And not even intentionally. And then to get mad at children for not knowing how to do something and not sitting back and being able to ask yourself, well, do I know how to do it? Mm -hmm. Have I displayed this for them? Like nobody asks themselves those questions when it comes to the children, educators and parents, because the children are getting it from both ends. It's like sit down and allow these children to have a voice so that they so that they can tell you how they feel because they know better than anybody how they feel. And, and one thing that I do wanna say too before we move on to the next question is that people who think children aren't being affected just because they aren't saying anything, if they experience it and they see it, because I've worked with children, elementary school children who come to school and cry for hours because they just watched their mom and dad fight. Now, mom and dad will say, they're fine. I didn't do anything to them. They didn't get hit. I, they're fed, they're clothed. They're... I had a little girl, she cried for hours. She would not speak, she cried for hours. Mm -hmm. And when I showed her some love and consistency throughout the day, she finally opened up and just broke down. And I'm like, we have to know that we're fixed. So she missed out on her lesson for hours. Yeah. So then the lesson doesn't get done. So then is she in trouble when she goes home because the lesson is not done, but not considering what she was dropped off at school with, right? Yeah. So just those are some things that I really want people to stop and think about because it's going to connect to the intergenerational trauma. It was probably done to them. So yeah. because it was normalized, if they could get through it, if I could deal with it, then you should be able to deal with it. It's how we do our children, right? Yep. And that's wrong. And what's interesting is that I feel like that was my story, as mm -hmm. especially middle and high school. And high school was even tougher because my dad left, had left the home and started the beginning of freshman year. Mm. Um, the thing I think that saved me was sports, but I didn't have the language to ex to explain what I was feeling. I, I didn't know how to say that I felt abandoned or that I felt betrayal because everything that I knew now was pulled out in front of me. And even in middle school, when my dad was still in the home and there were a lot, my parents were arguing and I'm in math class the next day, like I didn't get no good sleep because they was arguing and you expect me to sit up here and do algebra and you know, I can get by and get a C in the class or a B, but I'm not doing my best effort because I'm experiencing these things and right. I'm going through puberty right. and, you know, just all these different things. And I think having, um, I think about high school coach Hill and some of those coaches mm. that I had along the way, had I not played sports, then I don't know if I would have gone as far as I've, I went just on my own, but, um, 
just grateful that I had a village. And so I think that's where I do, um, I mean, I love my parents for so many other things because they've done a lot, don't get me wrong, but I think making sure I had a village so that when they weren't around, there were still adults there that were looking out for my best interest and not just saying, I'm gonna still get paid, right? Right, right. So, Absolutely. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad you highlighted that also, because I think the people who are in these um, positions need to know how, how much they can impact children. You know, just the consistency piece alone. If you know that you are going to school and you're going to your after school sports practice and there is somebody who is hard on you, tough on you because they believe that you are good enough to achieve the goals that they've set for you, that means a lot to a child who has emotional unavailable parents at home who may have the best of intentions who may not even know how to offer those emotions, mm -hmm. but you can still get them. And those are seeds being planted. You had seeds planted, mm -hmm. just like I had seeds planted, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and it makes a huge difference. Absolutely. I was just gonna add, um, I'll come back to it, it'll come back to me. Um, well, we're going to move into our second set of questions. Okay. So I want to just ask you, how did the trauma you experienced impact your career choice? Hmm. I remember being a child driving in a car and I would see homeless people and I would cry. And in my head, I would think, oh, if I could just go get them, give them a job and money and love and a home, and I would be able to see their whole life change in my head. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think I ever shared that with anybody. My mother always tells me, you always wanted to be a teacher. And I love teaching people what I know. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't realize what my journey was going to be. Um, I never thought I would go to college. I've been braiding hair since I was in high school. And so I went to get my cosmetology license at Laney. And, you know, hair is still that experience when somebody sits down in your chair and they start talking to you. It's like it's our barbershop. Right. Mm -hmm. And so everything I've done has always been helping. My friends always come to me like for everything. And when I went to school and another teacher who I still talk to in my cosmetology program, she took me under her wing and the success that I was able to make, I never thought was possible because I wasn't a good student at all um, up until that point. And so I'm like, well, let me just keep on going to school. So I just kept going and I've always wanted to do therapy. I've always wanted to be able to sit down with people one-on-one -on -one and just share and help them. Cause communication, I feel like I'm good at communicating and I'm good at expressing and I'm good at, you know, revealing certain behaviors and things that may have come from a time when we're told if that's the past, let it go. Mm -hmm. So. I believe that everything that I've ever experienced from birth until now has driven me to be in the place that I'm in. This mm -hmm. is my heart's work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. How do you manage trauma in your adult life? Um, so let's see. Hmm. <laughs> that is an ever evolving um, thing, you know, um, it's a constant evolution because uh, I may have a coping skill that I can use in one season of my life that mm -hmm. may or may not be available and or work for the next season of my life. Mm -hmm. So I just try to remain open. Um, it can be going to the gym, taking a walk, uh, shutting down from social media, um, intentionally making sure that I get eight hours of sleep, mm -hmm. um, checking myself, you know, cause sometimes I have to check myself and my own behaviors. Mm 
mm-hmm. just remaining open to my process as a whole. Um, being open to discover me mm. and listening to listening to what my needs are in that season of my life. So my coping skills range from grounding exercises um, to binge watching reality TV, if I need to, reading books, um, hanging out with my kids, calling my mom, you know. So mm-hmm. it, 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 it changes. And it will always be different, mm-hmm. you know, with a few exceptions, I'm sure. Like reading, I love to read and I love music, so. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that's um, I have that in common with you. The music is, I will make a playlist for however, whatever I'm going through and all them songs will hit just right at the moment. <laughs> and find and always find in a new, another book just to address whatever the issue is and really doing some research around which literature I want, not just picking books because people tell you because that may work for them, but actually researching it before I buy it yes. has been helpful, yeah. Books and music they're so unique in their therapeutic process because you get to connect with people Mm -hmm. and it's like, oh my God, that means somebody else has experienced something that I have. If their music can touch me in that way, you know, my Spotify list is long (laughs) with a whole bunch of different names on my playlist for everything. Mm -hmm. Um, And books, I remember at one point I was going through, um, a situational depression period in my life and I didn't watch TV I didn't want to do anything I didn't even want to eat but I read every day like I would read like five or ten books a week just reading 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 and everything I read God brought me to each book because everything I read touched where I was at and it mm-hmm. literally helped me to keep moving and keep getting out of where I was at in that space so people should be open. Self-care is more than hair done, nails done. That's right. You know. That's right. Yeah. I agree with that. Um, I, I, th- I used to think that, the, yeah, oh, I'm going to have a pamper day. Or I'm going to have a self-care day. And I'm like, now that is not it. I'm trying to find the ocean. I'm bringing all my little re- um, materials and strategy things with me. And when I get there, I might sit there for a few hours and read and de- take my chair out and have my water and all those things, or I may just walk along and just l- listen to the waves. I mean, that is always, um, it helps me to clear my mind, especially when there's a lot swirling around in there and I yeah. need to get focused. Um, I was telling somebody at the beginning of the pandemic, I was taking drives at least every other week. I would take a, I went down to Big Sur, it was closed, but I drove mm-hmm. t- highway one anyway. Then I went up to Oregon one day, just, just riding wow. and playing my music and just, letting up my thoughts, you know, gathering my thoughts so that I can be focused. And so this work really came out a lot of those drives. I finally came to the conclusion, okay, I got to get this podcast done. I've been talking about it. So yeah, yes. great. while 2020 has been like <laughs> a roller coaster ride, um, it actually has been a year that I feel like I've turned that corner Mm-hmm. And I'm no longer looking back because the, t- the corner is turned. I, I'm not, my past is, I've made peace with my past. I've, um, the, the trauma that was trapped, I brought it to the surface. I'm yes. continuing to heal from that. Um, and so a lot of things that had, you know, that I was focusing on relationships, it was like, okay, I had to go back to 15 to bring this trauma to the surface and deal with it. And I was grateful yeah. my grandmother was still alive in March because I went to her house. That's who I went. So that book, Grandma's Hands, I had that on the shelf too. I went to her house and we talked for four and a half hours. And four months later she passed. So Mm. I know that that was like supposed to happen. Like you talked about things that are supposed to happen. Um, And so now it's like full speed ahead. Absolutely, absolutely. That's wonderful. And I'm so glad that you shared that. And I'm glad that you answered the call to start this podcast because 
people need to hear and see people like them and hear what they do and hear that somebody else is going through the same things. You know, I've never even thought to get in my car and go take a drive, but now I'm like, you know what? That sounds therapeutic. And I think I'm going to add that to my list. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So the last question in this set was how does your family manage trauma currently? <sighs> So, goodness, I can't really say specifically how my family as a whole um, deals with their trauma individually, I'll say. Mm -hmm. um, for me in my family, communication is everything. It's what I'm teaching my children. It's what I'm trying to exercise myself. It's required for, for me, sweeping stuff under the rug and secrets and that's just damaging. Mm -hmm. So my family has grown a lot. Both of my parents, I love my parents, they're doing really well. Um, my children get to enjoy them. They get to enjoy my children and I'm thankful for that. Um, but I would say that addressing the trauma is one of the biggest challenges that we are still all dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, individually, it has to start individually first. Mm -hmm. um, the, the biggest transformation in relationships that I've had is with my mom. So we've done a lot of healing. So just being open to the communication is, is one way that we are working on dealing with, you know, family trauma. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, I feel like this year, um, well, my mom, we talk pretty um, authentically with my mom and she shares and she went through a lot as a teen. And so a lot of that carried on into, you know, into her later life, but she, this year, I feel like I've learned so much more that I hadn't already had some contacts for. Mm -hmm. And so it's just given us this space to talk and share and not feel judged and be okay with it. But then understand now why, okay, because of those things, I made these decisions, right, out of that trauma. And now that I'm aware of it, I can make better decisions or I can improve the way I make decisions, right? Because most of the time it was a reaction. It wasn't yep. a response. I didn't take a time, you know, you didn't take the time to sit back and really think about, okay, what all happened? And then let me, like you said, the communication piece was not there. You just on your own made a decision. And so now I'm really trying to gather all the information before I decide to respond to something. Mm -hmm. um, and even when I met with, um, Adversity, I'm not all of, some, there's still sometimes I get triggered. And so some of those ways let's try to sneak back up and I got to check them, but I'm aware of them now. Yep. And I feel like before now I can say, you know what? That person is, re is reacting that way because they don't know. Like I can't, we, just like children, you can't get mad at somebody if they don't know, if they never knew. And it, it's adults that don't know. Yep. And so this is your turn. This is our opportunity to say, okay, well, let me try to educate and enlighten them. So instead of getting upset and making internalizing it and making it about me, because they're really projecting what's going on inside on, on you. And so that's been one thing I'll say in the last couple of years that I've been working on. And in many situations, it has helped. In some situations, you got some people that's stubborn, they ain't ready to deal with it. So yeah. Absolutely. That just lets me low, long handle spoon till you ready. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Your your truth, us individually, our 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 truth is something that we have to be comfortable in, which will lead you to needing to get to know who you are on a deeper level than just what you've been told all of your life. So this mm -hmm. is where you can recreate your narrative, and. A lot of people don't want to own or admit that they don't know who they are and that they don't know what they want because triggers, mm -hmm. we all have them. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know I was being triggered throughout my entire life. I had 
I had no idea what that was. I had no idea what was going on. And now that I like just within the last couple of years, I've realized like, okay, you, these are called triggers going, going to graduate school helped me with that. Mm -hmm. And we have to be willing to, in communicating, communicating isn't just about talking. Mm -hmm. It's about listening. You have to be able to listen and allow people to have their own truth. Their truth may not align with yours. You may not agree with them and they may not agree with you, but that's okay. That's a part of being able to effectively communicate. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't want to do that. It's my perspective, my way or no way. And I mm -hmm. tell my clients all the time, one of the best things that you can do for yourself as a person is a get to know who you are what your beliefs are what your value system is and know it well know it well enough to know that yeah i was taught this as a child but i also believe in it as an adult mm -hmm. not just because i was taught as a child but because i've done my own research in my own life and this is a belief that i want to keep with me mm -hmm. and once you can do that then you have to have the ability to step outside of yourself, your mm -hmm. own perspective and see things from other people's perspective, especially if you invite them into your life as a friend, mm -hmm. a lover, a partner or whatever, because that person and that person's perspective may be completely different than yours, but them having a different perspective does not make yours wrong. It's just mm -hmm. theirs. Mm -hmm we can't personalize other people's feelings and behaviors. And we do, Yeah, you know, Absolutely. yeah. I thank you for sharing. Cause that's the, my biggest goal in the last two years has been listening with my heart. Mm -hmm. Because when you have that empathy and you listen with your heart, you can really hear, you can hear what the need, <clears throat> that need is that they really are looking for. And you're able to actually respond, like I was saying. And actually when they walk away from you, they are better than when you first interacted with them, right? And so yeah. that's been my goal because I feel like everybody always wants, I need my 10 minutes on the mic, but you're not listening to what the, the crowd may be ready to go home. So maybe next time you can have your 10 minutes, like you got to read the crowd. And so I hear you on that. Yes, absolutely. It matters. And sometimes yes. you have to know your audience so well to know when not to keep extending energy. Yes. Some people just aren't there. You, you can take that personally, or you can be grounded in your truth, your beliefs, your values, and be okay. And know that even though you may have to grieve the loss of their presence in your life or whatever it is, that that has nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing to do with you. And that it's okay. And it's okay if you, as a unit, friendship, whatever, if you guys are not okay anymore. Their season may be over or on a hiatus, mm -hmm. you know, that's okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Our third set of questions. What is intergenerational trauma? So a specific definition, you know, they intergenerational trauma is something that I think uh, Dr. Joy described um, in her YouTube, in that YouTube clip that I think can answer it so much better than I can. Um, but just an example, like we talked about, if your mom, dad, grandmother, whomever is rearing you responds to your needs or challenges with aggression, impatience, um, anger, and you still grow up to be fine. You are, you have a great education, you are self-sufficient, you have a family, but when your kids have something challenging going on and you respond the same way, that hurts you. But you do it because it's what you know. You do it because it was normalized. You do it because I turned out well. So that must have worked, right? So let me do it again. That's that intergenerational trauma. That's just being passed down and passed down and passed down and passed down as a tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as a way of showing respect and honor. But 
how come the kids can't be respected and honored too? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's how I would describe intergenerational trauma. And that's not the only description and or example. Um, there's intergenerational trauma, transgenerational trauma, multi-generational trauma, which I think they're all interchangeable, but it's all the same thing. If, if we have time um, and you can play that clip, like I think it would be really informative for people to just hear what she says. Um, it was really interesting to hear her explanation. I'm going to get it up. Give me one second. But while you, while I'm doing that, mm -hmm. I think um, one thing that stood out to me was the um, when you mentioned that, I always thought about the historical trauma as well. And how that sits, but my mom, she whooped us. I mean, we got whoopings. And I used to ask her like, why, um, sorry, why, um, why you whip us so much? She was like, well, my mama whooped me. And she was, she didn't play. Y'all better have this done and all of that. And my middle sister actually broke the cycle with her kids. She don't whoop. So she did therapy. They've gone to it would be all the ones that I don't need. Um, they've gone to therapy and she, I mean, her, her son may have got whooped once, but her daughter never been whooped. And so she, um, she broke that cycle and she was like, I didn't want to do that just because mom did it. Yeah. Yeah. And it, go ahead. Um, every kid needs something different. What I do want to say with discipline, mm -hmm. like all the lessons that I was taught, I value them. But like I told someone, you can teach the same lessons in love and mm -hmm. you don't have to use your love as a weapon. So my first son did not get spanked. Like I never had to spank him. Um, my second son... <laughs> He is giving me a run for my money <laughs> and he's had to get disciplined a few times. However, as soon as I'm done, we are having a conversation. As soon as I'm done, when I'm looking at his face and he's looking at me wondering, can I have some love now? Because discipline does not feel like love. He gets hugs. He, but I, I don't take back and I don't say stuff like this hurts me more than it hurts you. No, it don't. No, mm -hmm. it does not. But mm -hmm. you made a choice when you already knew the consequences. And this is what life is, knowing the consequences and making a choice. And you made a choice and these are the consequences, but I still love you. We can still talk about it and you're okay. And then mm -hmm. we move on. Absolutely. Okay, I got the video pulled up. Okay. Post-traumatic slave syndrome is an explanatory theory that really looks at multi-generational trauma. One of the things that's difficult for people is their first response is, oh my God, that happened so long ago. We're talking about people being captured, shipped, sold, beaten, raped, experimented on. And then you have to ask the question, did the trauma continue? Yes, so 300 years of trauma, no help free, no help, more trauma. If it's a sustained trauma, then the, the impact of that is also sustained. When we look at multi-generational trauma, we're looking at people who are maybe victims of natural disasters and their families and their children, generations of folks who have experienced war. Uh, and we know that there are residual uh, mental, emotional, traumatic impact. And what I did was I started to look at the African-American experience, starting with slavery, as a real clear, long, enduring trauma. So I started to see that there were clear connections between that survival behavior and contemporary living in African-American experience. I started to see common behaviors that I took for granted as, well, cultural. There's adaptive behaviors, survival behaviors. Well, what are they? Let's just say 2019, you have a Black mother and a white mother. The sons go to school together. They find themselves at a meeting. Black mother leans over to the white mother and says, I just wanted to mention to you that I noticed that your son is really good at playing. 
And the white person responded, so thank you. She began to go on and on about, he won the science fairs, I was an astronaut. She's an astronaut. The black mother's son is actually expelling her son. And she says, wait a minute, your son's the one who's going to be coming along. And the black mother responds, oh my God, he's a handful, but oh, he just works my nerves. Now, when I'm working with African-American people, it doesn't matter what the audience is. It doesn't matter what class. If I were to ask, is she very proud while she's saying those denigrating things? And everybody laughs and goes, of course, there's a secret. Because everybody Black knows that even though the Black mother is going, oh my God, she's really proud. So now let's roll that scene back to read the beginning. And let's say this Black mother is working in the fields and a white slave owner comes through and says, wow, that boy is really coming along. What is she going to say? No, he's not. He's, he's stupid. He's stupid. Shifters can't work. I don't want you to tell me. So I denigrate them to protect them. That is called appropriate adaptation when living in a hostile environment. The little white boy, say Timmy, you know, he feels really comfortable and happy about what his mom just said about him. And Trey looks at his mom and wonders, why can't you be proud of him? Because he doesn't understand the secret yet. And by the time he learns the secret, he will have already been injured by it. Post traumatic slave syndrome. PTSD um, is a disorder that occurs as a result of a single trauma. You don't even have to be there to actually get a diagnosis of post traumatic stress disorder. You could just hear about something horrific happening to someone you love. So you have people who have experienced it firsthand, people who have witnessed it in their environment, right? People who are continuing to be oppressed. That exacerbates any possibility of healing. So it's not post-traumatic stress disorder because then it becomes part of uh, what we call your socialization process. So you begin to normalize a way of living and being, everything from what we eat to what we believe it means to be a friend. You know, all of these things are colored by history. And if you don't understand it, you're going to fold in things that you've just assumed are normal. But post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, exaggerated startle response, outbursts of anger, a uh, feeling of foreshortened future. There was a point where there were you know, African-American children in different urban settings that didn't expect to live to be adult because they saw so much death that they started planning their funerals like at 13, 12, which I understand. And when you start looking at the simple biology, you start looking at the, the impact of stress on health. And while we look at general stress, you know, like finances, you have illnesses, all these different things. How about being black? How does factoring in being black in America impact your stress level and therefore your body's ability to operate its own immune system? Because we know it compromises the immune system. Once you understand it, then you can deal with it. Because you see, it's habitual. You socialize. It becomes part of your being. So one of the ways you begin to address that multi-generational trauma is to work with the people it directly impacts, to hear from them. And when you give the people the information, they can use it. I think the first order of business is beginning to have conversations. And the other is to educate the larger society. You have to stop the assault. So this is not purely a clinical thing. This requires social justice and change. That's where part of the healing is. It's not in a clinical setting or in a pill. It's in fairness and justice and safety and equity. We got to work with some of those clinical things, some of those issues of panic and anxiety. We also have to deal with the fact that you have a system that is set up to oppression and to continue to injure people. Both those things have to be dealt with. And they cannot singularly by themselves affect a change. They have to be done. Powerful. Right. You are on her. Are you friends with on her Facebook page? I believe I am. You know now though, Facebook, you I don't see anything. <laughs> she does know weekly, um, I think Wednesdays, every Wednesday, maybe at six or something like that. She does a talk. Mm -hmm. She has different guests come on. Sometimes it's a panel, sometimes it's her and her daughter. But it's powerful. It's just I think I've seen that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I just, um, yeah, I'll make sure that these resources that you shared out to our, um, our, um, the links are in the video when I post it to YouTube so that the um, viewers okay. can actually go and rewatch. So, okay. yeah, that's a, mm. um, 
that's a real definition. Right? Yeah. It makes you look at everything that we experience, everything that we do, how we talk, how we how we can't accept compliments, how we are afraid to stand up and be proud of whatever it is that we've done, you know, um, being a black woman, you know, the strength in my voice means that I'm angry, means that I'm aggressive, it means that I'm sensitive, that I'm, you know, no, I'm just a passionate queen out here expressing yeah. myself, that's yeah. it. You know, yes. but we have to redefine and um, give back what we've been given that does not work for us. Mm -hmm. And those stereotypes don't work. And we are living in them and living through them unconsciously, I believe, mm -hmm. you know, every day. Because that example that she gave it would not have been wrong for that mother to later say, hey, I, I know that you were sitting behind me and you heard what I said about you, you know, driving me crazy and getting on my nerves, but I want you to know that I'm proud of you. And that's a part of motherhood. Mm -hmm. Mothers are irritated by their children. I want to pull my car over all kinds of times and be like, get out, just mm -hmm. get out. But I love my kids. Yeah. So it's okay, like we feel, I don't, I don't have to explain. No, you don't have to, but why wouldn't you want them to know? Absolutely. Communication is huge. Mm -hmm. It can heal anything, yeah. anything. It's interesting. Um, you were talking about those stereotypes that they gave and I've a couple of the articles that I've been reading around black girls again, we're talking about kind of those three main roles that we get pushed in and that's Nami, right? Sapphire mm -hmm. and Jezebel. And I mean, you see, and if you see a lot of those same qualities in someone else, they would be considered assertive and that looks like leadership. But because of the color of our skin, yep. we are, um, we're aggressive, we're threatening. And like you just said, no, it's that's the passion coming through, right? So, right. I, you know, when I get excited, because I'm really excited about this and it may sound like, but I need you to understand what I'm saying. And so like, how do we, you know, trying to figure out how do we break those cycles from people perceiving us in that way when really it is not the case? We can't stop anybody else's perception. What we can stop is how it affects us. Mm -hmm. So you could call me a drama queen all day. Mm -hmm. I don't care mm -hmm. because I know I'm passionate, but that has to be taught. Mm -hmm. We have to start teaching our children different. We have to start teaching our girls and our boys different. Mm -hmm. our, our girls have to be taught that they are just as strong, just as smart, and that it can come through in how you deliver. But be careful because we have become defensive because we keep being stereotyped. And you have to be able to acknowledge when your defensiveness is intertwining with your passion, because I'm guilty of that. Mm -hmm. And we have to be able to have honest conversations. I've had a white woman, a superior at work, say to me constantly, why are you so mad? I'm not mad. And my voice sounded just like this. And I was not going to let her tell me that I was mad because I wasn't. Mm -hmm. I and I was not going to let her make me mad mm -hmm. and she tried and but I made her feel uncomfortable my intelligence my assertiveness I was making her feel uncomfortable but her comfort level is not my responsibility and we have to teach our children you're not responsible for making people feel comfortable with who you are you are responsible for being comfortable with who you are Mm -hmm. but you have to know who that is and those lessons have to be okay to learn inside the home when people say we have to fix our house first I'm a firm believer of that we have to work on our community first we can't address we can and we are and we need to address the systemic racism and everything that's going on the inequality everything that's that's not happening for us that we deserve in every system 
out here. However, we also have to work on what's going on at home. We have to teach our children that their voice is beautiful, that it's strong, and it doesn't have to look or sound or be like anybody else's. It's okay if, you know, the vocabulary that you use is not the same as Timmy or Sarah's over here. You can still assert yourself and be articulate in whatever it is that you want to say, but be confident. Mm -hmm. So that means that you can't react. You have to stop and process so that you can respond. So that it always comes back to communication for me. And I believe that our new vice president is one conversation that needs to be had in every household with a little black girl in it. Like mm -hmm. they need to talk about that. They need to highlight that. That needs to be talked about and nurtured and just offered the possibilities and how whatever that looks like. It may not be the vice presidency for that little black girl, but it can be whatever you want it to be and whatever it's going to look like for you and your individual journey, mm -hmm. period. We have to strengthen our children's voices and the knowledge of who they are and to know that it's okay, whatever that looks like. You know, you may have kids who may never go to college because that's not for them. Mm -hmm. encourage who they are that's, right. that's it mm -hmm. that's not easy though <laughs> no but we gotta keep it's possible. right 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 so how does intergenerational trauma affect families so it breaks down the bond it wears it down and it's like if you keep stretching out a balloon and blowing it up and letting the air out, blowing it up and letting the air out, or you wear something down with a rock or some sand, like you can just kill it. Mm -hmm. And the bond and the strength in the family system means everything. It, it means everything because if we're traveling down a road, and we're all linked together by chain and somebody keeps breaking the chain and we aren't linked, somebody can get lost. Mm -hmm. Somebody can get hurt. Mm -hmm. But if we stick together, we're always stronger together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But everybody is individual. Like if you look now, nobody is, I don't want to say nobody. There are less families sitting down at the table eating dinner together. Mm -hmm. They don't talk to each other. Girls feel misunderstood by their moms, abandoned by their fathers. Where do they go? The first person who shows them some attention. Mm -hmm. This is what I've been waiting for, but it's really not what you've been waiting for, but you don't know what you've been waiting for because you haven't had an opportunity to talk about it. Right. Intergenerational trauma damages mm -hmm. it damages the spirit it, it damages the the mental capacity to be healthy to be calm to be joyful to be hopeful it, it can it can damage that is that true for every family who has experienced trauma no Mm -hmm. But it has the ability to be extremely damaging to families collectively and individually. Mm -hmm. You know, people aren't drug addicts and alcoholics and sex addicts and love addicts and shopaholics and mm -hmm. for because they had this wonderful, great life that that's just not where that comes from. Mm -hmm. Um intergenerational trauma can be healed if acknowledged. Mm -hmm. um, when my grandmother passed on her, <laughs> she left instructions on what to do. So we, and we followed them to the T, but her last words was love one another. Yeah. And so many times, you know, you, you, 
you hear love one another. Okay, I love you, cousin, I love you. But no, it's action. And so what I've seen in the last five months is family text and phone calls who, to people who haven't talked in years, but now listening and talking, talking to each other, talking each other through some of the experiences that we're having maybe in the workplace. And I'm just seeing that bond that you talked about that could be destroyed if it's unaddressed starting to grow again, right? Piecing the family back together. Not to say that we were just scattered, but there were pieces of us that were kind of doing their own thing. You know, you get a, become an adult, you walk, start walking in your own lane. Yeah. But her words have brought us together on a level that I haven't seen probably since, and with my cousins and my aunties and uncles, mm -hmm. since I was a kid in Fillmore. And so I think like, you know, it was, it was like this, what would you call it? Why, why it was sad because now I can't call her, you know, it was powerful in a sense how it brought us together and you could just see her love moving through us. Yes. And in the way that my aunties are praying, I'm like, shoot, you was praying like grandma. <laughs> so, and I mean, they prayed for the kids, the baby, everybody got prayed for. We had a little dinner and mm -hmm. I just can see that love one another is an action word and I'm seeing the actions. Absolutely. That is the collateral beauty from her passing. Yes. Yes, yes. Right? Mm -hmm. That is a wonderful thing when we are open to wisdom. Mm -hmm. When wisdom speaks, you will be wise to listen. Yes. And she spoke because she knew that at the end of the day, the money, the jobs, the education, all of that is fine. It's great to have. It's one, in fact, it's essential. If you want to live in California, especially, you go have to have your job. But what, what matters, I could walk through the fire with you mm -hmm. if I know that we have something that is unconditional, even through my anger, even through the disagreements. If we have that bond and that connection, mm -hmm. then we could get anywhere together mm -hmm. and through anything. Yes. Wow. I'm really happy for you and your family. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. That's so amazing. In your opinion, how should families address intergenerational trauma? I think a very honest and open conversation has to happen with self first. Mm -hmm. If you are in a family where there is always conflict, where you continue to have issues with your children, where you continue to have issues with your siblings and you continue to have issues with your parents, have an honest conversation with yourself how have I been contributing to this and why? Those are, those are very important conversations because then the next conversation that needs to happen needs to be a family conversation, whether it's a one-on-one, -on -one, a group setting, you know, depending on what the situation is. And therapy is not a bad word. Therapy is not for people who are crazy. Therapy is an unbiased setting where you can go, have someone help you mm -hmm. communicate with yourself, with each other from an unbiased perspective and help you gain insight into the challenges and struggles that you're having into your in your life that can help you um, gain the peace and the peace of mind that you've been looking for to help you answer some of the questions. Why do I respond this way? Why am I so angry? Why do I get petty? Why? Because so you got to be that real with yourself. That's right. You got to be that. Do you get petty when somebody hurts you or piss you off? Mm -hmm. You got to be able to answer that honestly. Mm -hmm. And counseling can actually help facilitate that conversation even if you do individual counseling it can help bring that insight I've had so many people say to me wow I never thought about it like that when I offer them a perspective because see I'm not 
emotionally invested in that way. I'm emotionally invested in every person that I see because this is my heart's work. But I can see, it's like being over a maze and watching somebody walk through the maze. I can say, nope, go left because you're not going to get out that way. No, mm -hmm. go right because that's not the path that you want to take because I'm not in it. Mm -hmm. And that's what counseling can do. So I think that if people are open, honest, ready to hear some feedback, you have to be open to feedback. Even if it hurts, you have to be open to feedback. My son told me, I told you he was autistic, he's 24, that sometimes he doesn't feel comfortable talking to me because he is afraid that he's gonna hurt my feelings or that I might get upset. Well, I understand why he feels that way but I don't want him to feel that. That broke my heart that he felt that way. But I have to own who I was at 19 when I first had him. Mm. And it was challenging. It was hard. And I, had I known better, could have done better. But I own that to him. I'm like, listen, don't worry about my feelings. I'm going to be okay. Am I hurt that you're hurting? Absolutely. But I don't care. You own your truth. Mm -hmm. You are not responsible for my comfort. You own your truth. We have to be that honest and mm -hmm. that open to start healing. It has to be okay that what you did hurt somebody and they are still healing from it years later. That has to be okay. Mm -hmm. Even if you didn't do it intentionally, if that's their truth, that's just their truth. Mm -hmm. How can I support you now? What can we do now? What do you need from me now? And if what they need from you, you don't know if you can deliver, be honest in that response too. I don't know. Can I have some time? I have to think about it. Let me process that. I have to find some resources. I don't know what to do with that information. Be honest. Mm -hmm. Be honest. Communication is the key to healing. Effective communication is the key to healing. Okay. Yeah. And then the last question in that set, what are the benefits of addressing, managing, and healing from intergenerational trauma? Uh, happiness, hope, clarity, um, collateral healing for generations to come. Mm. Um, reparenting, you get to reparent mm -hmm. the child in you. And that's not easy to do, but to be able to heal and to feel like the child in you that you feel was wronged or broken, you can actually bring some peace to that part of who you are. That's priceless. Mm -hmm. And to have that bond to know that you are supported, to know that you have a village behind you. There's nothing that money can't buy that type of love and security. Money can't buy that. Mm -hmm. So there are so many benefits to healing um, intergenerational trauma. Um, it's definitely worth starting, you know. Absolutely. And so I'll move us into our last set of questions. Um, share anything you are doing to bring awareness to the effects of intergenerational trauma. So I would say my work. So in my life coaching business, I do life coaching. Um, I avail myself to people. I, I have a very unconventional approach in um, speaking with my clients. Um, and I'm open uh, to helping them in every aspect of their life. They are, they have access to me, you know, through text messaging, um, phone calls, emails, um, because you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. If you've never had that support and that person to say, hey, I'm here. And I'm also honest to help them set boundaries. I set boundaries because if I'm not available, then I'm just not, but I do it in love mm -hmm. and they understand. Um, I'm working on a book about fear. Yes. 
So that's one thing that I'm doing. I'm getting my license because I plan on having uh, a private practice. Um, I do, I'm a, I'm also a medical social worker in a hospital. So, um, I avail myself to my patients even, you know, we, I sit and talk to people for an hour or two if they need it. And I've talked to all type of people, even, um, one lady, she was from the Philippines. She has some trauma that she brought with her. And then she has her children who are American, right? And so we had a conversation and she was like, I'm so glad God brought you to me mm. to hear that yes. from her. And we have nothing in common. Like, I don't know what it's like to come from another country and have children here and go through everything that she's been through. But for us to be able to connect on a mother level, on a trauma level, mm -hmm. and for her to be able to get something from me, just being her social worker in the hospital, mm -hmm. she was so grateful. Um, she came back up to the hospital and brought me this humongous box of snacks. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, she's like, thank you so much and all of my patients feel that way and that feels good to me mm -hmm. that feels really really good to me so I'll always be open to having a conversation with people I'll always be open I tell people I'm going to tell you the truth I'm never going to lie to you um, and I'm open to being wrong mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so I'm trying to be the example that I'm saying is needed yeah Beautiful. Have you taken any action to advocate for healing from intergenerational trauma? Outside of my work and trying to instill in my children right now what's going on and what needs to be done, I haven't done anything as far as like being um, an activist out in the streets and I'm not that's not my path in mm -hmm. that way. Okay. So doing things like this, um, you know, speaking in different settings, I often go back to my cosmetology school when like the new classes start. My um, teacher asked me to come speak. Um, I was speaking to uh, some of the I forgot what they call them, classes through the social services agency. Um, I'm always uh, talking to young adults um, and I'm like being asked to go speak to different classes. So I do a lot of speaking um, in that respect, but that's, that's it. But that's a lot. That's a big that deal. Is. Yeah. That is, yeah. that's good work. <laughs> Any other issues that, are you taking any action to advocate for any other issues that the black community faces? I think that is our biggest issue. Healing internally is needed. We can't stop people from being racist. Mm -hmm. We can't stop what other people are doing. And I'm saying that meaning even after all that said and done, there are still gonna be some people that are gonna like us because we're black. Mm -hmm. What I think is our strongest asset is our community, our ability. And we, sh we showed that in this election alone, mm -hmm. coming together, being able to heal, stopping the violence within our own communities, within our own families, and not just gun violence, emotional violence, mental violence. We have to heal that. Mm -hmm. I, and, and I think that that is my role. You know, everybody has a different role. Everybody participates differently in helping to heal the community, bring it together, um, make things right. And that is my role. I, I'm a huge advocate of healing the family system and healing individually. Because if we do that, look what we can do. We can get somebody fired from the White House. Mm 
<laughs> if we can come together, like we are powerful. There was somebody shared a video on Instagram today, I believe, of this Caucasian lady. She said, I just want to thank all the Black women that voted for Biden um, because I'm so embarrassed that more than, I think she said 50% of Caucasian women voted for Trump. I don't judge anybody for their political preferences. You know, you like whatever it is that you like, that's fine. Um, but my biggest thing with just hearing her say that was look what we can do when we come together. Mm -hmm. Look how powerful we are. Mm -hmm. And I hope this doesn't stop just because we got, you know, somebody out that we wanted out. Like, can we see the benefit in coming together and healing and being on the same page? That's a big deal. It's a big deal. Mm -hmm. It's huge. Yeah, it is. So that is how I'm doing my part. And oh, it'll right. probably evolve, you know, as I am freed from homeschooling and because, you know, I'm a kindergartner again. Oh, yes. <laughs> and how's that going? It was needed. I, I'm, I'm happy and tired mm -hmm. that I've been able to help introduce my, because this is his first year of school. Mm. And to be able to help him in that way, um, I think it would have been really challenging for him to go. And so this was an opportunity. And so that's just how I look at it. Um, I would do things a little bit differently. So I'm advocating, I'm sitting on boards, I'm going mm -hmm. to meetings, I'm showing up. I'm like, look, mm, 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 that's not- Are you advocating for education? There you go. Absolutely. <laughs> In fact, I'm on the education committee, so- I love it. I <laughs> yeah. love it. Yes. yes. We, need more, we need more of our parents actually um, taking part in that. And I know sometimes they don't have, I know a lot of our parents are working two and three jobs to make ends meet, but those that have the time, I, I encourage them to get involved. And they see now, especially with the virtual homeschool, a lot of parents, it's just like, okay, drop them off for four or five hours and then I pick them up and you know, hopefully they learn something. But I'm seeing more parents like, wait a minute, well, why are they doing it this way and asking questions? So I'm yeah. like, you gotta get involved in your schools, even with the parent teacher association, whatever it is, even at the school board, like going to those meetings, know what they're talking about, understand the bills that are being passed, because they got the second, um, is it the Educational Secondary Act? I think it is. Um, it's often no child left behind, but they tweaked it. It's every student succeed um, bill. It's supposed to be so many resources, but nobody knows about them. So it's like, how do we um, educate and equip them around that? So I'm glad That's that you whole, are doing that. That is a conversation. Mm -hmm. What I want parents to know, if I can't say anything else, is that it's our choice. Mm -hmm. It's our choice. Yep. We It's actually our choice. And I was a warrior for my first son. Mm -hmm. I was I was calling IEP me. No, we need to meet. Well, it's, mm -hmm. it's their lunchtime. Tell them to bring their food. I don't care. Mm -hmm. We need to meet. It's our choice, but we have to be active. And it's not the teacher's job to raise our children. No. It's just not. It's their job to teach our children, but they can't teach them morals and respect and everything else, especially if they come home and they don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. So we have to do our part. It's a team effort is what yes. I tell every teacher. This is a team effort. So we have to work together. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your authentic truth with us today. I want to highlight a couple of... Um, more than a couple <laughs> of the pearls I heard you say. Um, and then you can let me know if that's what you meant and if, you know, if I need to change those. But I heard you say multiple coping skills will help you manage trauma. Mm -hmm. um, people need spaces to heal. Communication is required, like no more secrets. Um, get to know who you are, what your beliefs and value systems are and know them well. Um, unaddressed intergenerational trauma will break down the family bond. It must be addressed. When wisdom speaks, 
you would be wise to listen. Open and honest conversations with self first, and then the family can connect either on a one-on-one -on -one or as a whole. Therapy is always an option. It can help facilitate that conversation. Um, you have to be open to feedback. And then the last one, just in this part, effective communication is key to healing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I just, I just thank you because this was a lot, and I probably will be processing this, processing this conversation for the next, the rest of the week. But if you have any final thoughts or a tip that you want to share with the viewers, the last voice that they hear will be yours. Okay. Well, thank you again for having me. This was such an honor. Um, it, it, it is a pleasure to sit here. I've been knowing you for a great part of my life. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm just really, really honored to be in your presence this evening. Um, what I want to say to people as a final word is to forgive. Forgive. Forgive not for anybody else or for anything else, but just forgive for yourself so that you can be okay with whatever has happened or didn't happen in your life so that you can heal and move forward. Because there are things that have been planted in us as a people that this world is waiting for. Some little girl or little boy is waiting to hear how you were able to resiliently get through everything that you have experienced in life. So healing is a benefit. Being vulnerable is a benefit to life. Having emotions is a benefit to life. Men, I'm talking to you, it's sexy. And so just, um, you know, really think about if you have some areas in your life that you need to heal. And the benefit from that will be so rewarding and priceless that you'll wonder why you waited so long to do it. So thank you again, Erica, for having me. I really appreciate you and your work that you're doing and your passion. I appreciate you. Thank you, likewise.